One of the main reasons I started this YouTube channel exactly one year ago was so I could practice filmmaking. I made a promise to myself that every video I posted would be nice to look at, such that even someone who hated the content or the person presenting it would grudgingly appreciate the aesthetics. I think, or at least hope, that I have kept that promise. Yesterday I went deep on the process of how one of these videos comes together, but I didn't discuss a pretty critical component. What I use to make it look like it does. So today I am continuing the anniversary celebration by discussing just that. It is a good old fashioned gear breakdown. Hello by the way and welcome to the week I review. You can call me a camera store employee who makes great use of his discount. It's worth noting that I didn't actually buy all of this stuff for YouTube. A fair amount was bought for some short films that I was directing, one of which has since been canceled and the other is still in progress. As a result of that and my aforementioned discount, there is some definite overkill in my kit. So if you are looking to get started, don't think that what I have is like the bare minimum for acceptability. It's not. Anyway, there is a lot to get through and not all of it is going to matter to everyone, so I am putting the time codes for different sections on screen. If you only care about the audio or lighting or what have you, you can jump ahead to that. Okay, you ready? Let's do this. I don't think many folks on YouTube use Fuji cameras. Heck, not that many people in general really use them, and that's a shame because they're really great. While super high-end channels are using Reds and Canon C-Series, Epic Rap Battles now uses a freaking Alexa. I'm honestly shocked just how many channels are shot on Canon DSLRs or even point and shoots. I guess it probably has to do with the fact that they typically have flip out screens, but so do Panasonic's, which I imagine probably edge out Sony's among folks looking for better image quality because of the screen and also their relative cheapness. I would guess that Fuji's are slightly more common than Nikon's, but that both are quite rare. Which works in my favor though, because with very specific exceptions, I don't do any color work in post. I just put the camera on the classic Chrome color profile and that's my look. It's awesome, and also just a little bit different from everyone else's. I used an X-T2 for the first eight months of this channel, basically through the black pink video, but then I upgraded to the X-T3 because it added a number of video-specific features as well as much improved shutter readout and slow-mo capabilities, uh, all of which are why the vlog sections in the Bear Burger video look cleaner than those in say the Mac Weldon one. Though for vlogging, there is a critical issue with the fact that the X-T3 does not have a flip out screen, meaning I cannot see what the camera sees when it's facing me. When I'm here at home, I have an external monitor, which I'll get to in a bit, but it's more of a problem when I'm out and about. But because we're all trained to expect vlog footage from a handheld camera to be less composed. It's usually fine, though I always do have to do a test to make sure that I'm generally in the right place. In the end, the pros absolutely outweigh basically that single con. I did end up buying a battery grip as well, which was critical for the X-T2 in order to record for longer than 10 minutes, but not as much this time around. Really, what it does for me during recording is let me run the thing from a wall plug. But that is a big deal for me. When the battery died midway through my book smart recording, it totally killed my energy. I had backup batteries charged, so it was fine on that level, but like mentally, it was much harder to continue. I didn't want to do that again, so I got the grip. I keep it on a Manfrotto B free advanced tripod. It's actually a travel tripod, so it is quite compact and therefore good for this apartment. And the ball head is convenient for leveling, though I do wish it had a bubble on it for checking that. I never use it for travel though. Uh, for that, I use a Joby Gorillapod with a 5K ball head. 
I know that they have a reputation for not being extremely durable in the long term, but I honestly don't use it often enough for me to really be concerned about that anytime soon. Even so, I kickstarted the SwitchPod, which I think will probably be a nice alternative for many cases, but since I don't have it yet, I can't say for sure. Speaking of things I put a bunch of money towards but haven't used much yet, a just acquired Ronin SC gimbal, I have a problem. And also I saw a guy at JFK airport while I was on the way to Iceland vlogging on a Ronin, which made me and my Joby feel very inadequate. As I said, I have a problem, but I did figure out a use for it. One broader concern about using an X-series camera is that I'm basically locked into Fuji brand lenses. Other mounts, Sony E, Canon EF, Micro Four Thirds, have many more third-party manufacturers making glass, and there are a lot more adapters available for moving between mounts if desired. But there are no Sigma or Tamron X-mount lenses, and adapters are few and far between, with electronic ones that support autofocus, image stabilization, etc practically non-existent. Fortunately, Fuji lenses are really good, but there aren't quite as many as I would like, particularly not with optical image stabilization. The X-H1 has that in body, which is nice, but the X-T3 doesn't. Putting that or a flip out screen in an X-T4 would almost definitely spur another upgrade. I have two lenses that I switch between, each used for a different type of shoot. When I'm here in my living room and the camera is locked onto the real tripod, I use the adorably tiny 35mm f2. This was another active decision to make my videos visually distinct from most people who sit and stare into a camera. The typical YouTube look is wide angle, sometimes very wide. I didn't want that. The 35mm on the X-T3 is the equivalent of a 56mm lens on a full frame camera, or what people have determined normal to be. So there isn't the typical distortion of proportions, which honestly is a look I've never particularly liked. And since, as mentioned, I don't have a flip out screen, I do have to be a little bit wider when I'm out and about which means I switch to the 18 to 55 kit lens. I like it both because of the focal flexibility and optical image stabilization. I wish it had a constant aperture like the 16 to 55 f2.8, but unless I wanted to like really commit to using the Ronin for everything, that lens's lack of image stabilization is a deal breaker. I am enticed by the newly announced 16 to 80, which does have OIS, but is f4 even at the wide end, and has a slightly longer minimum focus distance, neither of which are ideal. Still, it's something I want to test out. When using the 18 to 55, I tend to stay a little wider than is required by the closer proximity to the lens because I can't actually see if I'm in frame and I have on a couple of occasions been completely off. Still. I try to be closer to 23 millimeters than all the way out at 18. The lenses both have quiet autofocus and I use it more often than not when I'm head on, but not always, I'm not using it right now. And I will always go manual in the second angle because the continuous autofocus just doesn't work as well when I'm off to the side and moving around. It results in the occasional undesired focus change and my basic attempts at Messing with the AF settings haven't done much to alleviate that, but if that's my biggest visual problem, I think I'm doing fine, and I'll figure it out. I also typically use a Hoya variable neutral density filter when I'm out. Variable NDs can sometimes result in an X appearing over your image where the different densities cross, but this is much more common and apparent in regular photos and long exposure photos in particular than videos. Peter McKinnon has those super nice, very expensive variable NDs that are built to avoid that in part by having much smaller range and forcing you to buy multiple. But those are expensive as heck, and this one has served me well so far. As I keep saying, the X-T3 doesn't have a flip out screen, so in order to make sure things look all right, I have to use an external monitor. The PIX-E5H, which is now discontinued, is hilariously overkill as a monitor. It is actually a 4K recorder and a very nice one at that, and it wasn't cheap, but 
When I got it, it was the only 5-inch 4K recording monitor available, and 7-inch was just a little bit bigger than I wanted to deal with. Now, I would almost certainly go with the Atomos Ninja 5, if not something bigger, since my use case has changed a bit, but this thing is really good, so I'm not complaining. As of June, I use three separate microphones. One is a YouTube standard, one is definitely not, and I'm honestly not sure about the third. My primary mic is definitely niche. I got the Audix HCX1 a couple years back because some blogs and forum posts said it was really good for interior dialogue recording, and I was trying to put together a basic filmmaking kit. I actually have a uh, Sennheiser MKE 600 for exteriors, but I have never used it on this channel. And I'm very happy with the way that it sounds. Particularly, I appreciate the way it totally neutralizes all of the ugly reflections that you would be able to hear in this room if you were talking in actual life. You know, the things that everyone spends a bunch of money on sound dampeners to mitigate. It's not necessary. By the same token, my neighborhood isn't always super quiet, and while in the early days I would actually restart recording if folks were talking in the hallways or doing construction down the street, I eventually realized that even if it's loud to me, it's just not in the audio, which is awesome. So the bigger issue has been me not getting distracted when there are loud noises everywhere, but it's something I've gotten better at as the months wore on. This actually gets a, a general note about technique though. You know, I have the mic on a not great, but serviceable RA mic stand, keeping it uh, between six and 18 inches from my face pointed down towards my chest. This is ideal. And if I move it too far away, it obviously sounds less clean. It's still quite good, but you know, technique is important. The only real downside for me is that the mic requires phantom power, so I cannot put it directly into the camera. I need to use an external recorder. For that, I use a Zoom H4n Pro. The Zoom H series is pretty standard issue. My college equipment room had a supply of H4s and H6s, and I've used one or the other on every project that I've done during or since. When it came time for me to actually buy my own, I waffled a bit before coming to the H4n Pro. It has better preamps than the non-pro version and so introduces less noise, which is good because I don't have someone just off screen checking my levels, meaning I've got to use the built-in limiter to make sure it never blows out while I'm recording. But doing that often results in most of the track being quiet because the zoom too aggressively reset the baseline after an audio spike. Fortunately, I can easily jack up the HCX audio 15, often even 20 decibels without worrying about noise being introduced. So that's cool. When I'm outside the home, I typically use the Rode VideoMic Pro Plus. It is the same mic that basically everyone uses here, and for a reason. I use the Deadcat windscreen rather than the included one, mostly because I paid for it and so feel compelled to do so, but also because it provides additional cushioning, and I'm apparently awful at keeping it on the dang camera, so it adds a little peace of mind. It probably helps with wind too, but it's certainly not perfect, as you can hear from this unused clip from my Iceland trip. It's so windy. It's, it's so windy. The clearest benefit to this mic over my others is that I can put it directly into the camera, or even my phone if I were so inclined to record that way. When I don't want to deal with the not difficult but still extra steps process of setting up multiple recordings and then syncing in post, it's nice to just have the better audio right there but putting it on top of the camera is a problem if I'm more than a few feet away, even indoors, but especially out. I can do a little bit in post to address excessive ambience, but really it only makes sense when I'm holding it or am otherwise very close. When that is impractical and I have a little bit of extra setup time, I now use a Tascam DL-10R, which is a lav mic connected to its own external recorder. I actually got it for a different project involving a fake YouTube channel because I wanted to get that sound. Listen to the difference between this mic and my primary one. They both sound good, but the lav mic definitely has a harsher character to it, which actually made it feel more YouTube to me than the HCX does. 
perhaps you don't agree, it may depend on whose YouTube videos you watch. Instead of clipping it to my shirt the way a lot of folks do, I actually attach the lav to my chest with some medical tape. While this can introduce some noise if my shirt is moving around, that's infrequent enough to be an acceptable trade-off for the cleaner look of not having a visible mic, at least to me. Zoom's F1 is a similar device that is slightly cheaper, but the general consensus is that it's a weaker product than its competitor. In any case, either is much cheaper and less complicated than a real wireless mic system. Rode has a couple of options I haven't used before that are cheaper and ostensibly simpler than your typical wireless setup, but the all-in-oneness of the DL10R appeals to me, even if it means another potential fail point and step in post. As I said, part of the creative impetus for this whole project was to work on technique. Lighting is where that is particularly true. I knew from the outset that I wanted to use the window back there in the way that I do, and there are a couple of reasons for that. One, it's different. I'm sure that I'm not the only person to use a blown out window like this, but it's not something I've seen before or since. And two, it removes distractions from around my head. You obviously need depth in an image to make it interesting. But putting something like a busy bookshelf behind you is a guaranteed way to distract folks from what you're saying, especially if your head moves around as much as mine does. If every single time I moved, something slightly different was visible to you behind me, your eyes would be momentarily drawn to whatever that new thing was. With the window, there is literally nothing behind me. Of course, this is somewhat dependent on weather and timing. When it's cloudy out or if I have to shoot later in the day, you can see some of the buildings across the street and when it's partly cloudy, all of that can change over the course of the video as the sun comes in and out. But that's just a thing I have to accept. However, it means that I really need lights on my face to compensate. And every single video shot in this apartment right from the very first one has been lit at least in part by a pair of these. Until a few months ago, the Luxley cellos were my primary lights. At first, I actually diffused them with actual paper towels, but the company has since released dedicated diffusers, so I picked up a pair of them. Since the lights don't weigh much, I can use the wonderfully small Manfrotto Nano Stand. A uh, while back, I actually would use a pair of adapters, a quarter inch 20 to shoe, and then back again, but with articulation, to angle the light. But it was a somewhat awkward setup and made no tangible difference to the image, so eventually I just screwed the light directly onto the stand, and that is how they have stayed. The best thing about the lights, though, is their versatility. Aside from hitting a wide range of white color temperatures, they can also do any number of specific colors on the RGB spectrum, and though that has always been true, I never actually utilized the functionality until my review of Gaspar Noé's Climax, which, you know, just begged for some red and green, and I think it came out great. But color on my face needs to be motivated by the subject of the review, so it's not a common thing. However, my newest acquisition has allowed me to use the cello's color capabilities in other ways. I actually got the LEDGO ring light for the same short film I got the Tascam DL10R for, and I'm glad I did. These types of lights are particularly common amongst beauty vloggers because of their flattering effect on one's face, which has grown on me over the past few months, possibly by necessity. It is a very different kind of lighting, but it's a pleasant one. It was really affordable, especially considering its ability to change color temperature, but it seems to punch above its weight class, and I've been happy with the results. On the note of weight, the LEDGO light is a bit heavier than the cellos, so I can't use the same nano stands. Instead, I have a Matthews Murph Mini. It's a great stand, not much larger than the nano stands, but much more solid. 
However, since the light also mounts via quarter 20, I have to adapt the baby pin on top of the Murph Mini. I use a Manfrotto Rapid Adapter, then I don't have any complaints about it. But with the ring light as my new primary front light, I can now use the cellos to throw color on the back wall, which is an effect I like a lot. Speaking of my back wall, as I mentioned before, depth is critical to having a nice looking quote unquote cinematic image. So from the outset, it was clear I would need to use some rear accent lighting. Fortunately, I had a pair of Aperture M9s already and they are perfect for this. They're small, cheap, get unexpectedly bright and have built in batteries that last quite some time. I keep the included magnetic diffuser on and put a sheet of CTO gel in between and then put them up against the back wall, pointed uh, straight up. I've had them in a few different configurations over the past year before basically settling on this one, but the lights have been with me since the very beginning, and their presence does a lot to make this whole thing work. I also bring them with me when traveling to uh, use as a bit of extra light if such a thing is necessary. For example, you can actually see the reflection of the LEDs in this shot from my Iceland video. Aperture has released a follow-up of sorts in the MX, but it's more than three times the price, so I'm good with my M9s. If I'm doing all this right, you don't know that I have been using a teleprompter since my very first video, except for the cases where I draw specific attention to it. And yeah, of course I do. It is the only way for me to make these videos the way that I do. If you watched anything from the first few months, I think it's more obvious because I was still figuring out how to read naturally, but I think it clicked somewhere around the new year. I use the Parrot V2 because it's cheap and small while doing exactly what I need it to do, for the most part. It is basically just a plastic hood with an angled mirror that screws directly onto the filter thread of your lens via one of the included adapters, though I had to buy a $2 step-up ring to fit mine that has since gotten stuck, whatever. The one downside is that I cannot use it when I'm outside because I cannot screw it onto my ND filter. But in those cases when I still want to read, as in the first half of my vegan burger comparison or the review part of the Iceland video, I just put the text and the tablet right above the lens for whatever reason that's enough to feel like I'm looking at the lens. But a look from just below, as seen in my best movies of the year video, does not. The actual text is mirrored from a smartphone held in place by springs, or in my case, a small tablet that came with my previous television, a Vizio P50C1. This is literally the only thing I use it for, and it serves the purpose beautifully. The accompanying app syncs to Dropbox, so I can just put the scripts there directly from my laptop, and it connects to a little Bluetooth remote that lets me start, stop, and scroll through without getting up and also losing access to my phone, which is good because how could I ever survive not using my phone for however long the record ends up taking? While we're talking about how long this can take, I think it's worth mentioning the unsung hero of all of this. I talked earlier about plugging my camera in, but it's important to say that that actually applies to everything in this kit. All of it, the lights, monitor, recorder can run on batteries, but only the rear lights and the teleprompter tablet actually do so while I'm shooting. Everything else is plugged into a surge protector that itself is plugged into a power conditioner because I like to have clean and consistent power going through my expensive electronics. This has resulted in me tripping over the resulting tangle of wires on multiple occasions and a few of the lights falling over as a result, but nothing has broken yet and it's a worthwhile trade-off for never having to worry about something turning off mid-shoot. Also being power conditioned, my editing setup. It's a custom build mostly comprised of parts from a few years ago that I've recently been looking into upgrading since some interesting new things have been happening in the CPU space, but I haven't really gotten that far in that yet. In any case, the current specs are on screen over my face. 
All I really have to say is that I have made an effort to buy more gaming focused components rather than workstation ones because the latter are more expensive, way more expensive, and generally concerned with stability over short term performance per dollar. Premiere Pro, which I've been using for probably a decade at this point, isn't known for its stability anyway, and since my editing time is typically much less than 10 hours a week, 24 7 uptime doesn't mean much to me. Heck, I can get by with even less than all that. I've edited a couple of these videos on my laptop. While editing on a Huawei MateBook X Pro is hardly ideal, the problem isn't really that it's underpowered. The screen is just too small for comfortable editing, especially compared to the 27-inch screen I typically use. And also a trackpad just isn't great for that sort of thing. But considering the lightness and small size, it is shockingly usable on the go. Here, I edit on an HP Z27N G2 monitor. My second monitor is some Asus thing that I've had forever, but as I discussed yesterday, I use it for gathering assets rather than actually expanding my editing workspace. I always edit with a pair of Audio-Technica M40Xs that aren't super comfortable for long periods, but they were free and definitely sound quite nice. Um, that, that's it. That's the show, or, or at least the physical objects that make the show happen. I think it's a pretty good kit that I've got here. And of course, there are places I can and most likely will improve in the future, but that's all in due time. For now, 7.9 out of 10. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, awesome. If you didn't, I'm sorry. If you wanna see more, please subscribe. I've got two more videos coming this week. It's a lot. This is a lot. I'm very tired now. I hope to see you then.